Welcome to the Jewish Drinking Show, the number one podcast for drinking in Jewish wisdom, history, tradition, and more. Yes. Welcome to the 109th episode of the Jewish Drinking Show. I'm your host, Rabbi Drew Kaplan, and I'm very excited to welcome first time guest to the show, Jacob Nir David. Uh, thank you. A joy to be here. Absolutely. So for those less familiar with Jacob here, he is a 20 plus year veteran of serial entrepreneurship and technology, technology innovation with deep connectivity in the Israeli and American venture scene. He is the co-founder and CEO of Vincent, the center of venture formed to positively disrupt the global wine industry and a partner in Vino Ventures, a wine trading fund. He is the chairman of the award-winning Jezreel Valley Winery, which he co-founded in 2011. He does a lot of other things in various business ventures, and he has lectured at the Hebrew University and the Technion, as well as guest lectures and many other fora. He received a JD from Georgetown University Law Center and a BA from City University of New York and was an Isaac Scholar at Mansfield College, Oxford University. He is a Crown, Henry Crown Fellow of the Aspen Institute. He is the life partner of Rabbi Dr. Chaviva Nir David. Together, they are the parents of seven kids. He enjoys hiking, mountain biking, and long-distance running. My Wine is kind of a big part of my Torah, as the saying goes, you know, in Torah, bli kemach, right? I mean, you need, need both to go along. And I always say anybody interested in starting a winery, investing in a winery, getting involved in a winery somehow, mm -hmm. wine business, uh, you have to be prepared for a patient, passionate pursuit of profit. Mm. You're missing any of those things. You're, you're going to be very frustrated uh, mm -hmm. and you're going to burn yourself out. And you're not going to have any fun. Mm. <laughs> so, um, and, and having fun is a big part of it. Mm -hmm. So the, the, what led to founding Jezreel Valley Winery was, you know, this classic story, which I, I often tell, but I think it resonates with a bunch of other people. And I don't know how it was for you. And I know you're not only wine, you also dabble in other, other, mm -hmm. other drinks. Yep. Uh, uh, we won't I, hold that again. We won't try to be a pluralist. Again. Try to be yeah, a pluralist. Yeah. <laughs> we won't hold that against you. Um, but uh, but even if pluralist has their favorites, you know. So, yeah. Um, so my mine 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 is wine, and I really I know very little about uh, about whiskey or ouzo or or much other things. A little bit about beer, but mainly wine. Mm -hmm. And and the main reason is because of that again classic story of this yeshivish kid, me. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, seeing his uh, father you know, fill the becher all the way up and, and, and over, right? So the mm -hmm. cup, cup runneth over. Mm -hmm. uh, say the bracha on the, on, you know, to, to bring in uh, Shabbat and, or Shabbos and um, take a little tiny sip. And then if my mother wasn't looking, pour the rest back in the bottle. And me mm -hmm. looking at saying kind of what's going on here? Yeah. One, you're supposed to drink, you know, you know, you know, Abba, one, you know, you, or Tata, you're supposed to drink, Rovkos, mm -hmm. uh, you basically just said a bracha levatala. You know, like, what, what, what's happening here? And my father's saying, every time I would question him, who can drink this stuff? It's <laughs> terrible. Who's going to, nobody drinks this. <laughs> I said, well, then there's got to be, there's something wrong with this imagery, right? There's something mm -hmm. wrong with this story. Mm -hmm. Because we're fed this constant diet, right? Uh, certainly in, when, you, when you have a yeshiva education, of you know, wine being the central, central, central place, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Both our personal lives and our communal lives, mm -hmm. uh, wine having this central place. And we can't basically do anything without wine. Mm -hmm. And so it just wasn't making sense. Uh, and so I, I, I kind of my rebellion was saying, I got to go out to the world and find <laughs> wine that actually makes sense. Uh, which is which is what I did, and then I had the flash forward. I had the fortune, one, to be able to uh, make my way to Israel and, and settle down in Israel, mm -hmm. but also at a very auspicious time for the Israeli uh, kind of the, the rebirth of high end winemaking in Israel, and got exposed to the, the folks that were doing that uh, then. I'm talking about in in the in the nineties, places like Castel and Sorek and a few others, and. Um, discovered like, wow, there's really good wine being made in, in, in Israel. Mm -hmm. uh, so I almost started a winery in 2001. And you referred to my tech uh, venture background. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what happened uh, then? Dot-com implosion. Mm -hmm. I had a, lot less, had a lot less resources than I thought I did. But that wasn't the, the main reason why it didn't work out. It didn't work out for just, you know, the stars didn't align. And then we moved to Hanaton from uh, Jerusalem, where we've been living for many years. 
We moved to Khanaton in 2009, and I met somebody here named Yehuda Nahar, who was a foodie, uh, a food writer for Israel's leading newspaper, Ynet, discovered that he also loved wine, and he discovered that I loved wine, and he was kind of looking to change his career anyway. And he said, you know what, I'm going to go study winemaking at Tel Chai. There was a new winemaking program that started, and maybe we'll do this together. Maybe like I'll, I'll actually work in it. and. Mm-hmm. You can do what you love to do, which is kind of help get things started and so on. And, and to, to complete the circle, there was an abandoned building uh, on the kibbutz where we both moved to. It's a privatized kibbutz, but, you know, had been built as a classic kibbutz. And there was a, an abandoned building, which had, it was originally built as a tractor repair shop. Mm. So very high ceilings, uh, uh, you know, a, a workspace outside, you know, all the things you would design a winery building around. Um, and had been sitting empty for 15 years. And he's like, and here, here's our winery building. We can just take over this building. Um, so that's that, that's what happened. And our first harvest was 10, 10 harvests ago. Um, and uh, the, the vintage uh, that, that we call 2012. And we've been making wine ever since. You've won a, some awards along the way too. Yeah, you know, it's a funny thing when you start to make wine, you... Mm-hmm. It's a lot like in a in a tech tech product, particularly a consumer product. Mm-hmm. You you know you can invest as much as you want. You can hire the best people, um, have all the best equipment, all that. Uh, obviously, you have to start with the right uh, raw materials, which in our case are grapes, mm-hmm. um, and we'll talk more about that in a second. But at the end of the day, uh, there's just there's magic that happens. Mm-hmm. It's nothing, nothing, you know, it's, you know, you want to call it Ashkafa Pratit and divine inspiration. Mm-hmm. Uh, other people might just refer to it as magic, but it's the artistry. And sometimes it clicks and it works and, and the team just kind of works together and turns out exactly what you were looking for. And we just had the luck that it, that it happened. Um, so ju- even from that first harvest in 2012, we already were winning gold medals mm. um, and uh, continued uh, throughout the years. Um, and in fact, we even took a step back from participating in competitions, or whatever, because we were like, oh, we don't want to get too focused on that. You know, that's mm-hmm. not what we're here for. Um, but then I got reminded on the business side that you always need, you know, the new shiny thing, right? Mm-hmm. So you, need more, yeah. you need some more things. So, you know, uh, um, you know, I'll give you an example. This is Argamon 2019, which I'm mm-hmm. drinking right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's a little earlier in the day for you, so I'll, I'll, I'll forgive you for not drinking wine. But um, but we always say it's four o'clock somewhere. But, um, anyway, this is Argaman 2019. 2019 is a very young Argaman. Already got 93 points from uh, James Suckling, one of the leading wine critics in the world. Um, and we then we had sent six months ago the 2017 to the decanter wine competition. Mm-hmm. Not knowing what would happen, it's uh, one of the prestigious, most prestigious annual global competitions. Sent the the um, the 2017, mm-hmm. and uh, lo and behold, just a couple of weeks ago, we got uh, word back that we were the highest rated wine of the year uh, mm-hmm. with six points from from decanter gold medal. Um, so we're quite quite excited by that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the, you know th- that's all nice objective. If we can call it, or 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 outside affirmation, yeah, third party, yeah, yeah, outside affirmation mm-hmm. that that we're that we're we're doing not only what we love, but what we but what we love is actually working. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So happy about that. Cool. Can I ask you a question? This year is a shemitah year. What are you? How's? I mean, it's okay. So you've done one Shemitah cycle in the past. What is this year like for you on the winery end in a Shemitah year? So I'll tell you, but first I'm going to take a drink of wine. So Baruch Atah Adonai, Alam Bari Priyagafen. Amen. You know, it's a fascinating question because even though we're a privatized kibbutz, we still have, we still do things in common. One of the things in common that we have is an avocado orchard. And I was out in the avocado uh, fields this morning with kids from Khanaton who were working in the field uh, with somebody from Khanaton who's the manager of it. And we were talking about Shemitah year. And one of the things that the uh, kids were doing was was literally uh, pulling the fruit off the tree and and, and letting it drop. So we got into the, to the whole Shemitah conversation. The Shemitah cycle 
you're correct. The Schmitz cycle that we had once before mm-hmm. uh, in our in our winery lifetime, <laughs> there were two things about it were a little bit different. One, we were much smaller. We had mm. we were growing. So 2012, we made uh, we made 15,000 bottles of wine, and then the next year 25,000. The next year 35,000. Now we make 100,000 bottles a year. So a little bit different proportion mm-hmm. in terms of to now than what it was for what it was back in, in uh, the last cycle. Mm-hmm. The second thing is we've had time. Then it kind of came up on us really quickly. This mm-hmm. time we really had time to dive deep and say, you know, how do we really want to do this? Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we've been trying to do with Jezreel is make, make wine that has a real Israeli identity. Mm-hmm. When people, there, when they're drinking is Jezreel, we use it almost only Mediterranean varieties, varieties that belong here. We're not trying to force something on the land. Mm-hmm. And very similarly, when we were looking at Shemitah, we were like, okay, you know, there's, uh, you know, Otsar Betin, there's Heter Mechira, there's all these different kind of workarounds to Shemitah that that could use. We said, you know what, what would it be if we said less is sometimes more? You know, if there's less Jezreel in the market in two years from now, mm-hmm. maybe that's exactly what, you know, what's intended. Mm-hmm. So we took a decision a couple of months ago with all of our partners and all of our growers and that we are not making wine from this coming harvest. Mm-hmm. We're 100% observing Shemitah in the traditional sense. Um, oh. So that's a big step for us. So it's a huge step. How does that, I mean, I how, how are you working with that? Because that means you're not going to get revenue. On the other hand, this might be a segue to something totally different, which is I read elsewhere that your winery is doing NFTs. So I don't know if that's a just a different revenue stream if you're not doing a harvest. So it, it, one is not necessarily connected to the other, but, okay. <laughs> um, but, but, it's, but yeah, in terms of revenue. So you have to remember that when you're making wine, if I'm making wine from, you know, the harvest of, of uh, 2021, the, the civic calendar, 2021, um, when's that wine going to be ready? Well, it depends which wine. Some will be ready in a year, some will be ready in two years, some will be ready in two and a half years, mm. right? We tip all, our wines are all, are all different. Mm. Uh, we make many different wines. We make blends. We make young blends. We make more aged blends. Mm. Uh, we have our icon blend, which uh, uh, sits in barrel the longest. Hmm. So it really depends kind of which wine. So there are some wines that get turned around within a year, mm-hmm. some are two years. So for example, there's going to be some wines that will be coming into the market uh, when our, let's call it young Shemitah year wine would have been ready, but it's going to be our more aged blends from the previous harvest. Hmm. So it's not like there's going to be no new wine coming out for any, you know, piece of time. It does, it's more of an internal issue where we have to uh, slow down the sales over here. Uh, We have to make sure we have inventory over there because Mm. one of the things about developing Hasidim in the world is Mm. that, you know, you don't want to disappoint the Hasidim. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, there's some long period of time where they can't get any Jezreel, Mm -hmm. then they'll go to the next Rebbe. You know, mm-hmm. like we'll, yeah. we'll lose them. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, you want to retain the customer customer loyalty. Yeah, you want to make sure you want to make sure. So whether it be restaurants that we you know succeeded in getting on there, you want to make so you have to put wine aside, which from a, a financial point of view is a massive cash flow drain mm. on the winery because yeah. I haven't monetized it yet, I haven't mm-hmm. sold it yet. Mm-hmm. It's sitting. I I spend a lot of money on it already, and it's sitting in barrels. <laughs> or maybe in bottles, uh, and I've got to just hold on to it to make sure that, that there's wine in the market where, where it's needed. So, you know, it's quite, quite challenging, and there's a lot of both logistics and Excel acrobatics. <laughs> there's Rath Hashem, but a low workout. Hey there, I wanted to see how you're enjoying the episode so far. If you have any feedback, comments, questions, anything, please let me know. And also, if you have topics as well as uh, potential guests, including, who knows, maybe yourself, please let me know. Feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. Thank you, and now back 
into the show. We just participated literally the past few days mm-hmm. in, in a release of our 2021 icon as a future. That future is represented by an NFT, mm-hmm. meaning by a digital certificate for those people who aren't familiar with NFTs. It's a digital certificate that gets registered on on a blockchain. And that way you could take that digital certificate, you could give it as a gift to someone, you could sell it to someone, whether kind of off market or list it somewhere. So it makes a contractual uh, obligation that you paid for all that more valuable because now it's more easily kind of tradable or transferable. You don't have to come back to me or talk to me. Mm-hmm. In two and a half years, when we release Icon uh, of 2021, mm-hmm. so whoever is holding you know, those golden tickets mm-hmm. will, will be the ones that will be able to redeem them and get their bottles of Icon. So we, we started this uh, a few days ago in cooperation with a particular uh, friend of mine who's an influencer mm-hmm. in the investment space and a little bit in the wine space as well. Mm-hmm. Um, we've sold, uh, so far about, uh, 600 bottles already mm-hmm. of, of the icon 2021 as a future. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very excited about that. It's You're not saying the- through the NFTs through making. Yeah, yes, yes. People and- will receive NFTs. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we did a similar, uh, a similar, project, two, two similar projects um, mm-hmm. this past year, back in September and October, we did, uh, f- but, but they were more kind of private, I would call private label, um, kind of made by Jezreel, but mm-hmm. kind of brand, somebody else's branding for two different NFT releases that wanted to be backed by wine. Um, so we kind of made a special blend for, for each of those. Uh, so it's something that we already kind of ex- have experienced with and on the tech side of my life, you know, it's, I, I can talk about, you know, I can geek out all day long about that. I can geek out about wine and I can geek out about tech. So <laughs> uh, I can do both. When I can bring them together, it's, uh, it's Machai. Yeah, for sure. So, so how often do you plan on re- minting these NFTs? Is it really for this special, like you were saying, the icon, the highly special wine yeah. releases? So the answer is yes. I think mm-hmm. um, while I, I, you know, I'm, I'm here surrounded by uh, all my wines, so mm-hmm. I can't say anything, you know, about one more than the other. So you know, I love all my, <laughs> love all of you guys. Of course, <laughs> I don't love any one of you more than the other. Yeah. Um, but um, you know, they're designed to have different places in the market. Mm-hmm. Um, there, they, some of them require different investments from us. A wine that stays two years in the in the winery obviously costs us more money than wine that mm-hmm. stays eleven months in the winery. It's just mm-hmm. uh, simple economics. And then there's wines that we sell much more of, produce much more of, mm-hmm. wines that we have much more limited production of. So I don't. I think the NFT story is an interesting story, which could go really widespread. And we could end up, not just us, I think, you know, boutique wineries around the world, and you see more and more of them coming into it, mm-hmm. uh, basically having a digital twin for every bottle of wine that they produce. And the reason to do that is, number one, uh, authenticity. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's some way that I can link this physical bottle of wine to a digital record on the blockchain, um, then that makes this... The, the trust that I have that this bottle of wine is indeed what it is, uh, all the more so. You know, we, were, we require, you know, we, we depend on, on mashkichim to give us some level of trust, right, in, in the kashrut process. But there's also, uh, sadly, right, there's, there's the, there's the uh, yetzahara of, of people around the world to, you know, fill up bottles with, with what we would call plank or bulk wine and label it whatever they choose. Wow. You, know, if, you know, if you can imagine... I don't want to give anybody ideas, right? But you know, if our if if a Jezreel icon sells at retail when it first comes out for $80, $90 a bottle, and then after a couple of years, if you can find any, right, the price will zip up to $150, $160 a bottle uh, or more. For somebody to look at that and say, hey, I could just buy bottles and fill them up and 
print la- my own labels up. Uh, and that'll cost me like, you know, $3 a bottle. Mm-hmm. I could, you know, put it online and sell it for $40, $50, that, you know, undercut the, the market price. So mm-hmm. that happens a lot, much really? more than, oh my goodness, much more than anybody would care to, you know, discuss. Wow. But in the wider wine world, it, it hasn't, it has affected uh, the, 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 the world of Israeli wine and it has affect, it has mm-hmm. affected wines that are uh, supposed to be certified kosher. Wow. It has, but in the wider wine world, oh my mm-hmm. goodness, right? There's mm-hmm. the big joke. Uh, you, I'm sure you might be familiar with uh, the, um, the, the, the Bordeaux winery, uh, Smith, yeah. Smith Haute Lafitte. Okay. So Smith Haute Lafitte, uh, it's one of the kind of top wineries in, in Bordeaux, mm-hmm. connected to the Rothschild family. Smith Haute Lafitte, um, the joke goes that every day in China, they sell more Smith Haute Lafitte than Smith Haute Lafitte has ever made in the history of the winery. <laughs> um, and, but it's not only in China. We, we, like to, we like to knock the Chinese, but it's not only in, in China. There was a study by... Ernst and Young in Italy, where they pulled wines off the shelf at random, mm-hmm. and they found uh, that twenty percent of the wines on the shelf were counterfeit. Wow! Wow! Yeah. And then on the high end, if you want to have a fun, fun, fun uh, look, it's on Netflix. Mm-hmm. If you want to watch, uh, and I pray that Israeli wines will reach this level that people will will want to counterfeit them. Um, uh, watch a documentary called Sour Grapes, about counterfeiting in the, in the wine industry. It Thanks. focuses in on one specific character who ended up getting arrested and so on. Mm-hmm. That one guy alone uh, pushed more than $500 million of fake wine into the market. Wow. Wow. Anyways, those are, th- th- those are real issues. But mm-hmm. besides, besides the authenticity and so on and, and mm-hmm. provenance, right? We want to know how many people have owned this wine and so on. Uh, you know, we, we we need to take ourselves seriously. If those are if those are things that the the, the, the you know the greater wine world cares about, we should care about them too. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, fascinatingly, fascinatingly, it's a way for the winery to actually be in touch with people who own their wine without requiring them just a little, you know, just to geek out on the technology without requiring them to sign up for anything or send their email address in or whatever. If I see that you are holding an NFT that represents, you know, a bottle of Argamon 2019, then I know that that you've uh, bought Argamon 2019. I don't have to know who you are. I can just mm-hmm. kind of scan all the wallets, all the digital wallets, mm-hmm. see uh, where those uh, digital tokens are, and and I can actually send you like a, a present, or I could send you a coup- a discount coupon, or whatever, without knowing who you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a fascinating. Fascinating new way. As I always joke, and I love our partners in the States, and I know Jeff Morgan, uh, I listened to the episode with, with Jeff, and I'm deeply honored to follow Jeff on this. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, he's one of my favorite people. So mm. uh, Jeff, you know, sung the praises of the Herzog family. So, mm. uh, you know, I, I will also sing their praises, but, mm. you know, with all the praises that I could sing for the, for the Herzog family, you know, at the end of the year, if they've helped me sell 30,000 bottles of Jezreel in America. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't really know where those 30,000 bottles went. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's one person that really loves my wine or, mm-hmm. or if it's 30,000 people that bought one bottle of wine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a little bit, but yeah. that's essentially the, the level of the information sharing in the wine world. Mm-hmm. And also, if so, how are people to redeem those NFTs when when that icon comes out? They come straight to the winery, and then they collect their bottle, and then I guess you somehow document that that's been claimed. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I mean, the the classic approach to uh, NFTs, meaning last week, um, mm-hmm. <laughs> was you you burn the NFT, you kind of got rid of it. Mm-hmm. There's new ways of uh, what's called changing the metadata on the NFT itself to show that uh, the wine's been claimed. And now you essentially have a souvenir mm-hmm. that you once owned. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. it's, it's like, a, you know, uh, there are wine bottles that I have that are empty that I'll keep for a long time or forever uh, just because I loved that wine and I decided to keep the bottle. 
Yeah. Or tickets to a baseball game that you already attended. Yeah. I, I have those too. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Souvenirs are important. Okay. I've got menus. I've got menus from Grossinger's. So, uh... <laughs> and so that's, so the NFT thing is on the newer side for you, for your winery. Yeah, it's on the newer side. We started, mm-hmm. as I said, the first one we did was back in September. Mm-hmm. Um, we're just uh, doing one uh, now, mm-hmm. um, which you're the first person to know about it because it was a very limited release to this specific community, but it, it's done well. From us and from other Israeli wineries, you'll see more of it. Mm-hmm. You're also seeing it from wineries around the world. Again, how long will it take for it to become truly widespread, mainstream, You know, as we like to say, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I'm usually pretty good at predicting the future, but I'm usually terrible with timing. So it, it, it will happen because it's a great, great, uh, great, great technology, but I just can't tell you exactly how quickly it'll happen. Hello, I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. I wanted to break in and give you a sneak peek into next week's episode because if you like Israeli wineries, this is going to be an interesting archaeology one featuring Dr. John Seligman. And this particular wine, uh, which is known by the name uh, Gaza and Ashkelon wines, becomes exceedingly popular in the whole of the Mediterranean area. The whole of this wine seems to be a white wine. The wine was of such good quality that the uh, historians of the period described it. I hope you enjoyed that that sneak peek into next week's episode featuring Dr. John Seligman. Now back into this week's episode featuring Jacob Nier David. Jacob, so far this has been interesting hearing about Jezreel Winery, Jezreel Valley Winery, and the NFTs you guys are doing. What's this Vincent project you've got going on? One of the things that I'm a big believer in mm-hmm. is what I call a hybrid model. That mm-hmm. there are stores, and I think stores are very important mm-hmm. uh, in terms of retail stores. Mm-hmm. Uh, introduce people to wines to fulfill your need for uh, an everyday purchase of wine and so on. Mm-hmm. Uh, I apologize if there's noise in the background. We're a working winery, and I think they're working in the background. Um, the, uh, you also have people who have two issues. One, they have access issues, and they want direct connection to the winery. So what does it mean, access issues? And because of the distribution uh, system in, in, of wine, uh, it's a heavy product, uh, bulky, so on. To widely distribute wine in a, in a country as big as the United States, for example, is, is, is quite exhausting and would take a very long time to get widespread uh, distribution in stores across the United States. So you have a lot of access issues. A lot of people who say, hey, Jacob, I heard about your wine or, or I was at the winery. I was at a friend's house when I was visiting New York or whatever. But I live in Louisville, Kentucky. You know, where, where, do you have stores in Louisville that you know, carry your wine? No is the answer. Um, and I don't expect to have any stores in the near future in, in Louisville. But there's no reason why that person in Louisville shouldn't be able to just press a button and get it delivered to their house. Um, so I, I, this weighed on me more and more. And then I said, okay, if I've got this issue, let me check if other wineries around the world have this issue. And I talked to friends who have wineries in Tuscany, in Bordeaux, in Burgundy, in Spain, and I saw that we're all suffering from the same issues, particularly accessing the uh, U.S. market, but not only, which are how do I easily kind of rev up a direct-to-consumer uh, operation without get doing it myself because it's just not something that I'm set up to do. And I saw there weren't any easy platforms for me to plug into. So that then my entrepreneurial thing kind of clicked in. And I was like, okay, I got I to gotta create one if it doesn't exist. So I created Vincent about two and a half years ago, almost three years ago, uh, or started to create it almost three years ago. We launched it about a year and a half ago. And it is essentially a direct-to-consumer platform for particularly for cross-border situations, meaning wineries from uh, France selling into the US, wineries from France selling to Denmark, anywhere where it's the winery is not in easy proximity to you and there probably isn't distribution. Hmm. So uh, a lot of fascinating kind of wineries just kind of heard about what I was doing and approached me some kind of, I said, word of mouth. Some were friends of friends, all, all kind. And we got a group. And then we also realized the price disparities between kind of what wine costs, for example, in its home market and what it was selling for in the States. Hmm. And, and, and the reasons for those are, are, are legitimate and obvious. 
there are a lot of hands along the way. There's an importer, there's a distributor, there's the store, right? Everybody's taking risk. Everybody's working. I, I don't, you know, I'm not, I don't want to take anything away from any of those people. They're all doing holy work. There still remains as a big price disparity. So we said, okay, if there's a, such a price, price disparity exists, can we also do something where now that we've gotten to know the logistics of the wine world really well, is there an arbitrage opportunity for us to play? And that's how we started the wine trading fund, where we buy wine in one market, bring it to another market, um, and fully licensed, sell it direct to consumer uh, and or put it on auction. But, um, but there's still someone importing and someone uh, maybe a yeah. and distribution. So, yeah, well, we are. We have all the licenses. Okay. So there's no, there's no other hand along the way that needs to be fed. So there's no, like you cut out the distributors, cut out the retailers. You're just right. importing and then DTC to the okay. See an auction. Um, uh-huh. And by doing that, you kind of can, can, can make a nice return mm-hmm. uh, by moving wine around the world. Again, the wine world, people forget how big the wine world is because sometimes we look at our own Daladamos uh, in terms of trying to dis- uh, understand the wine world. The global wine industry is a $350 billion a year industry. Mm-hmm. The uh, Israeli wine industry last year, unfortunately, only exported $50 million worth of wine. Uh, Compare that to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. New Zealand last year exported over $2 billion worth of wine. Oh, wow. So we have a ways to go to catch up to to New Zealand. And I believe we should be catching up to France. So Mm -hmm. we have a ways to go. France exported $60 billion. But so these are big, big industries. And within that, you have what I would call the, the fine wine niche of that, right? The, the more boutique wineries, the high-end wineries, well, everybody has a different name for it. But essentially wine that's going to go for $50 or more retail in the U.S. per bottle, uh, where people care about the story of the wine, people care you know, where it comes from. It's, you know, they're not, it's not boxed wine. So we started a, a fund where all we do is use investors' capital and we buy and sell wine uh, and, and make money off the, off the, off the spread. Um, during our first year of operation on the fund, we've generated over a 20% return net to investors. So I'm very happy on that. Um, and we've uh, helped people in the US access wine, which was difficult for them to access. Uh, so I'm happy, happy about that. Whereas anybody, anywhere, you know, uh, borrowing from a, a friend of mine uh, named Jeff Pulver, uh, one of my mentors in the tech world. You know, he said, people always ask you, where's the pain point? What pain are you trying to solve? And he said, who wants to deal with pain? That's not a happy subject. Mm-hmm. Instead, let's talk about joy and delight. How are we bringing joy and delight to mm-hmm. people around the world? Yeah. Uh, and as, as somebody who makes, makes wine, I'm not solving any pain. I'm trying to bring, <laughs> if, you, if you're drinking my wine to get over some pain, mm. t- take out the, take out the, uh, what do you call it in the States? Take out the Tylenol, take out the, the mm. aspirin or what have you. Mm. Don't drink my wine to get over, get over pain, mm. but do drink, you know, my wine to increase your, your joy and delight. Mm. That's what it's about. Yeah. So we've been growing this direct consumer platform, which is Vincent. Mm. We developed a different arm, which is, just buying wines as well, mm-hmm. uh, rather than only listing them on, on the platform. Mm-hmm. And then we developed this expertise, which I brought to Jezreel, mm-hmm. developed this expertise in cutting edge techniques like NFTs and wine mm-hmm. and so on. So very soon we're gonna be releasing uh, NFTs. This is not Jezreel now, this is my other wine stuff. We're gonna be releasing NFTs representing some of the top uh, top top wineries in Bordeaux mm-hmm. from the 2021 uh, 2021 vintage as futures as well. Uh, this is through Vincent or through yeah, Vino Ventures? Through through Vincent. Through uh, Vincent. Vincent. Um, Vino Ventures is more we're we're buying and selling. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, Wait, can I is, uh, just? I was slightly unclear. So with the Vincent, yeah. you're saying the financial arbitrage comes through cutting out the distributors and the retailers because you're directly importing it, right? right? 
Okay. Um, that, that's what we do in, in Vino Ventures. Mm -hmm. um, but it also comes from... Wait, Vino Ventures or Vincent? In Vino Ventures. That's how we generate return. Uh, okay. We're doing some of the same things in Vincent, but mm -hmm. in Vincent, we're not trying... We as a platform mm -hmm. are not trying to make a, a spread mm -hmm. uh, on, on, on what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, in, whereas in, in Vino Ventures, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to generate as much return Mm -hmm. uh, so my interests are not as aligned, let's say, with the consumer, mm -hmm. uh, but they're still aligned because I, I'm still delivering them wine at cheaper prices than they would otherwise get. It. Yeah, and Vincent, how many how, rough percentages? How many of the wines are either Israeli or kosher? Uh, so or both. But <laughs> the reason the, the reason for there to be Israeli. Or and or kosher certified uh, wines of the platform is mm -hmm. is because I'm the CEO. But uh, otherwise, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, they wouldn't be there. Right. Uh, I, I, that's why I assumed they wouldn't be there. But since you're involved, percentage. how many small, of them are either yeah, kosher certified small, or small? Small percentage, maybe okay. five percent. Maybe five percent. Okay. I think, and this is part of I think the education that you're doing mm -hmm. and the incredible stuff that you're doing. Thank you. Which is. Which is education, right? Mm -hmm. People often in the let's very loosely call it Jewish wine world, mm -hmm. which even in that Jewish wine world, right? What what is a Jewish wine? Right? Is it a a wine from Bordeaux that has no connection to Yiddishkeit but just been certified kosher somehow? Mm -hmm. And you have a lot of those wines flooding the market now. Uh, a lot of them very good, and a lot of them separate runs from some real top names in Bordeaux who are doing separate kosher certified runs. It's not actually the same wine because they put it aside. Um, it's not actually the same wine, but it's, it's essentially the same wine because they're starting with the same vineyards they're starting with the same grapes and so on, but then they have to kind of separate them out without getting into the real philosophical debate of, you know, who is a Jewish wine? Uh, I, my interest as a uh, Zionist and a, uh, a Jew living in Israel, is to promote Israeli wine. Does that mean I, I'm against Jewish wine? No, but it means I'm promoting Israeli wine. You know, a friend of mine just is turning a, a winery in Hungary into a kosher certified winery. Mm. His great grandparents were winemakers in Hungary. Mm. So he's kind of doing a tikkun, a personal tikkun, and he, mm. and he and he he bought a winery and he's turning it into a uh, 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 kosher certified winery. Mm -hmm. uh, there's you know beautiful stories like that in the world. Uh, the Herzogs themselves, right, were making wine uh, back in Europe before they before they went came to the states. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, the, but but for me, it's about promoting Israeli wine in the world and and having Israeli wine gain a real identity in the world. Mm -hmm. And in order for us to do that, we have to educate people. And we have to educate people around, you know about wine in general, but particularly Israeli wine. Mm -hmm. And the what used to be called the kosher uh, consumer, you know, today, as you know far better than I, because you're, you're, you're living in the States, almost everything is stamped kosher today. I mean, it's not like a big deal, right, from a mm -hmm. kosher consumer point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, 35, 40 years ago, it was very difficult to find good to great wine that was certified kosher yeah today you could find it literally from from all over the world mm -hmm. so uh, my interest is in promoting israeli wine my own winery after that but i think you know uh, what's the expression a rising tide carries all ships mm -hmm. I think promoting israeli wine and then promoting our wine hey there i hope you're enjoying this episode so far i want to break in again and if you have ideas beyond the show beyond the podcast beyond this video content if you have ideas for what jewish drinking can bring you whether it's who knows maybe it's zoom sessions maybe it's uh, events maybe who knows swag please let me know i'm very curious to hear from you any ideas things that we can do uh things that I can bring you from Jewish drinking. So feel free to reach out to me at drew at jewishdrinking.com. I'm happy to bring that to you. All right, now back into the show. How would you describe you going back to just real Valley winery? You, you were talking about the sort of the origin story behind the winery. How would you characterize the identity of your winery? Mediterranean, uh, 
uh, from a kind of taste profile and a winemaking style and the types of varieties we focus on, Syrah, Carignan, Argaman, mm-hmm. it's definitely Mediterranean, mm-hmm. uh, going with the going with Mediterranean cuisine and so on, which obviously means Israeli cuisine. Right after that will be us, our story, our personal story, you know, the team, the people mm-hmm. who are lovers of the land, lovers of modern Israel, but very respectful of tradition and history. Right, so if you look at the, the names of our blends, our single varietals are obviously named after the varietal. But if you look at our blends, right, we've got Alpha from Beit Alpha, the ancient Jewish community of Beit Alpha, mm-hmm. Nahalal, the first modern Moshav. So we're coming out with a series, uh, literally like next week, of wines in collaboration with an Israeli artist mm-hmm. named Asaf, with uh, modern, when I say modern, you know, over the past 120 years, but modern <laughs> Zionist, modern Zionist figures um, as as uh, motifs for the labels of the bottles. Mm-hmm. You can think of Beryl Cutts Nelson or or uh, Aleph Dalit Gordon on wine labels. Um, so also trying to teach history through our wine, both mm-hmm. history and our our current story, right through through the wine. So that that's what we're trying to do, and we literally want to do an. Thank God, I actually saw a review just the other day of one of our wines. And I was so pleased that unprompted somebody wrote this. We really want people to, when they're drinking our wine, to give some subconscious, whatever scent, that they're like drinking the land of Israel, that they're mm-hmm. connecting through the wine to the land of Israel, whether they be Christian, Jewish, lapsed Muslim. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to get anyone in trouble, but... Um, <laughs> Right, whatever you are, that you are really feeling, wow, this is a place that's been making wine for thousands of years, that's got such a story to tell, uh, right, in terms of of, of winemaking and, and wine in, in, in such a central place. You had said earlier, trying to do more native, um, I want to say native varietals, you know, things that are... Ar- Argaman, so the Argaman, which, thank God, has just done so well. Mm-hmm. You know, people laughed at us 11 years ago. We took inspiration from a winemaker named Avi Feldstein, mm-hmm. who before us had, t- had come out with a high-end uh, single varietal Ar- Argaman. Mm-hmm. But almost nobody else had attempted it. Argaman is a very challenging grape to work with, but it's only grown in Israel. That's, it's, that's the important part of the story here. It's only grown in Israel. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it has a wonderful, wonderful kind of modern history to it. It was actually created by the... Israeli Ministry of Agriculture in the 70s uh, to be the ultimate kind of terroir wine for, for Israel. Mm-hmm. And when they created it, I don't know if the color comes through for your audience, mm-hmm. well, the ones who are just listening, it definitely not, but I'll describe <laughs> it to them. But when they, when they created this wine, they looked at it and they went, Argaman, right? Mm-hmm. That's what this wine is, right? Because mm-hmm. Argaman is one of those colors in the Bible where there is no reference given. Right, uh, uh, you know, as opposed to Trelet and a few others. Mm-hmm. Argaman, there is no reference given. So, like, they looked at this and they said, that's Argaman. It's this deep, deep, deep kind of crimson, but deep crimson, mm-hmm. um, very powerful. And then the taste profile is just, is just, in, is just wild. I urge everybody, you don't have to buy ours. There's also a, a Barkan came out with a, uh, an Argaman called Beta Argaman. Uh, which is quite good, but definitely, definitely try Argaman. It's only grown in Israel. We've also played around with varietals uh, like Dabuki, which grows wild uh, here. We're we're constantly looking to innovate. We're constantly looking, as I said, looking back and looking forward. Like what we so we were the first people to create what's called Petnat Petulant Natural in in Israel, which is a uh, natural, uh, kind of naturally bubbly wine, hmm. where the bubbles come from fermentation that takes place in the bottle. It's a super funky uh, winemaking style. You don't know exactly how it's going to turn out. We did it the first time we did it, we did it with Dabuki, uh, and it was incredible. Um, and then we now have a, a Carignan Rosé uh, Petnat. We have a Gewurz Petnat. Both of them we just literally released. I don't think they're going to make it to the states because it was too limited production. But we're 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 always we're always playing around. Jacob, thank you so much. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing about your wine endeavors, your your many 
many wine endeavors. Uh, before we go, is there anything you would like to promote? I always have things to promote. Okay. So, First of all, my winery, COVID was a very challenging time. We continued to win prizes and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, you know, cash flow was quite ch challenging. So if anybody who's ever thought, wow, I would love to invest in an award-winning boutique winery, mm -hmm. uh, which is already uh, distributed around the world and served in Michelin star restaurants and all that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. um, definitely get in, get in touch with me. There's an investment opportunity. Uh, and we pay liquid dividends. You get wine. Uh, if you invest in the winery. Uh, so that is that is definitely number one. Two, if you just simply want to make money off your money, but like the idea of the exotic asset of wine, uh, you can invest in my wine trading fund. You don't have to think about anything. We do all the thinking for you. So you can get in touch with me about that as well. Those are my two plugs for the day. Awesome. Wonderful. Jacob, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. And L'chaim.